All right, let's get started here. Uh, welcome everybody to, uh, to the presentation this morning. We're talking about how to design your kitchen with the best luxury appliance brands. Um, I'm Pat Palingo from Yale Appliance and with me is Steve Scheinkoff, our CEO. Um, a couple housekeeping, housekeeping items while we get started here. We're gonna send the recording out to everybody who registered. So just keep that in mind if you're thinking about taking notes, you'll get the whole recording and presentation after. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Uh, if any questions come up along the way, we can dive into those at the end of the presentation and we'll make sure we tackle all the questions that were sent in during registration as well. Um, a couple items before we get started here, we have a new, uh, if so if you signed up for our presentation today, we also think you'd like our Appliance 101 series that's available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we dive into a lot of detail focus on how to start your kitchen project along with how to choose different products and, and compare different brands across refrigeration, cooking, dishwashers, laundry, et cetera. Um, and that's available right now on our YouTube. There's a playlist ready for you. Um, and then also we have a new office hours um, a segment we're doing every week on our YouTube channel uh, where we're going to just take a uh, take popular topics, popular questions we see um, all the time and dive into answering those along with any live Q&A that comes up. We're gonna just, um, we'll be doing that weekly on our YouTube and Facebook at 4 p.m. on every Thursday. So with that out of the way, Steve, you wanna take it from here? Certainly, thank you, Pat. And thanks everyone for um, joining us today. The title of the webinar is how to design your, your kitchen with the best luxury appliance brands, but it, it works on so many levels. It could be how to start a project. It's a met, we're gonna introduce a methodology that I think will work for any kitchen bath. Those are the two rooms you really need to focus on. Those are the two rooms with the most variables. And I think the methodology that you're gonna to learn today is gonna to help you immensely. When I think luxury kitchen is just more stuff really than, than, than another kitchen. And so I had a hard, had a hard time starting this. Where do I start? And then it occurred to me that this picture we showed every webinar because um, the guy who helps me with the PowerPoints happens to like Drake. This is Drake's kitchen. Now, a lot of you are probably looking at the appliances, trying to figure them out. And uh, so I, I took what they are. Uh, the, the appliances, that he has a, in the corner, a 18 inch uh, wine cooler. He's got a refrigerator freezer in the back left corner. He has a dishwasher. He has a La Cornu Chateau Supreme. Only four of those were sold globally last year at $130,000. It's easy to figure out why. And then he puts a white La Cornu hood over there. On the, on the right, you have your Mila coffee maker, steam, and speed oven. But I don't want you to focus on that just yet. This kitchen works on many levels. The flow of this kitchen, whoever, he had a great designer, but he had a great kitchen person. Somebody knows how to design a kitchen and you'll figure out why in a second. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about these for a second. And this is what you're gonna learn. We're gonna tell you how to start, which is the hardest thing to do. We're gonna tell you what not to do. I have three slides on what not to do for new construction. Interlaced is some pictures of really beautiful kitchen style raw. We have the best luxury appliance brands, no one brand satisfies everybody based on your buying, based on your own cooking needs. And we're gonna talk about best luxury appliance options. You have more options, certainly in a larger kitchen. We're gonna talk about how to make your kitchen unique. So if you default to a white cabinet, gray countertop, white subway tile, we're gonna make it so it looks different than your neighbors and friends. Then we have to talk a little about service because highly technical products need highly skilled technicians. <laughs> And that's, they're not easy to find. Then we're talking about availability. Everybody's familiar with the supply chain issue. There is a way around that as well that we'll discuss at the end. So with all due respect, let's get started. The next four slides are really how to start. And they, they, they can be, I started uh, architects, builders, and contracts. You need good ones, quite honestly. Um, and this is where you want to spend the time. This is a job interview, not just hiring somebody. You want to match their experience versus the project that you're doing uh, for various reasons. And great GCs know the greats, uh, know the best subs. We're a 99-year company. We don't work with the subs that damage things or that have delays, and neither should you. And one thing that you want to keep in mind, 
Um, I've uh, redid my apartment and uh, built a, a burnt out brownstone in the last five years, as well as helping to manage some uh, projects in Framingham and our new store in Hanover. And the one thing that I've learned is good trades, people solve problems, bad ones cause them. And the good ones will give you the ideas. And that is a very good place and should be the place you start. And here's some questions. You know, Pattery said, don't take notes. Um, you can screenshot this if you're on YouTube. Uh, we'll be sending you this. But really, you want to gauge the experience of what they've done, what the references say about them, how they can. One of the big ones is how do they manage through the project delays? Uh, and th there's going to be a bunch now with supply chains just being so random these days. So take these 18 questions and figure out who your, who your partner is going to be in the job process. Now, these are decisions you think you have to make, right? Because these are decisions that I thought I had to make when I was, when I was uh, building my place. And uh, I'll never forget it. I wanted a rainfall showerhead in the worst way. And I spent a lot of time researching anyway, rainfall showerheads. I'm sad to report that four years later, I still haven't taken a shower under that head. The other ones are just so much more convenient. You talk about color vanities, tile, what appliances you get. I mean, your bathtub over, matching your sinks. You know, you want to get to that level, and that's not where you start. Where you start is right here. What is your lifestyle? How are you going to use it, especially in kitchen events? Is how much space do you have? How do you use that space in terms of kitchens? How do you cook? Do you cook with other people? Do you cook, right? Do you entertain often? How do you, how do you cook, bake, broil, grill, griddle? These are all the questions that have to do with lifestyle. So like the Drake Kitchen, his flow is good because he's answered these questions. And so for that, you have to start somewhere. And this may sound like an awkward place, an awkward answer for me, a, a, an appliance person to say, you should start at your sink. Sink's the most used appliance, if I can use that word, in your kitchen. That's where you're there the most. It completes what I will call the kitchen triangle, which I'll show you later. You don't have to put an overhead vent, so you could put some beautiful lights in. We used to be in the lining business, those are Harvard and Forge wrought iron lights. This is a great kitchen. This is the number four most viewed kitchen on house last year. That's got to garner millions of views. And there's two big problems here. First problem on uh, is, is directly under the, the hood that they put in is not 24 inches deep, so it doesn't cover the uh, power the power burners and the burr in the top, and if he and if he or she griddles in the middle. But the second thing, if you use this kitchen, right, and they just you know the details, some of it you should look at, you know the the the, the floor and the ceiling, the the black handles, all are different details that really distinguish this kitchen. But the real big problem is where they put the sink. So if they're using that cooktop. What happens if, God forbid, they burn up? Like, you know, if some burn, where's the first place you turn? It's your sink. So where they should have put the sink is they centralize it. They should put it more towards the range top, which is what I'm showing you here. This is my kitchen. I never have to move more than one foot between the, the sink, the dishwasher being next to the sink on the right-hand side, and the range top. Now, the other things you don't have to worry about, wall ovens, refrigerators, they're not mission critical to your, to your, uh, to your kitchen sink and range top are the ones that are there the most. To give you an idea, two related yet very different people. That's my kitchen on the left. That's my sister. She um, builds and flips homes for a living. Look at where her sink is, right, right next to her range. She doesn't have to move. She just stretches her arms. She didn't put any lights over there, but she put a TV in her, in her, in her hood. That's a really cool detail. Um, I could send you specs on how to do that if you want. So we're going to centralize our sink. And the only other thing we have to worry about, yes, it's this easy, for, for the flow of your kitchen and the design of your kitchen, is whether you're going to do wall oven or range. Difference is you centralize with a uh, with, with range, obviously. And on the wall oven, you don't bend. You can also accessorize a little bit better. Um, that's a steam oven over that. I could put a warming drawer underneath. I could just put a microwave or a speed oven on top of that and not have a, uh, a steam oven. And you really don't get those options in a uh, pro range until you hit 40 or 60. So you can personalize a little bit better with, a, uh, with the wall oven. But the wall oven, once again, doesn't have to be centralized. You're not checking your turkey every five seconds. 
Wallman's and refrigeration go anywhere. After this, everything is a standard. Dishwashers are 24 inches because that's the cabinet standard. Refrigerators, I would say if there's 100 people watching right now, you, I would say 85 to 90 of them in a luxury kitchen, a, a refrigerator of 36 inches to fit a 36 inch cabinet, 42, 48, same thing. So it's that easy. Those, those are your focal points after that. It's about, sec, we'll talk about secondary appliances afterwards. Now, what not to do? You've already seen venting. But take a look at this. We show this in another webinar. This is really, somebody really put, the designer put a lot of thought into this, right? We got a barn door on the left. I love the stone hearth. I love the distressed table there, but where's the vent? And the question is, is like, that's a Gen Air cooktop. You can tell by the metal knobs on the side there. And I believe it is a 19,000 BT burner. So what happens when you cook on the 19,000 BT burner? You're going to smoke in your kitchen. So how do you fix that? Well, you'd have to drop a hood from the top, get rid of those lights. And then you'd have to break through the ceiling to vent. That's very expensive to do. Or you'd have to uh, cut a hole in the granite for a downdraft and then vent down and out. That's very hard to do. It's almost probably easier in some cases to just redo the kitchen. So you want to rethink. After you've done your cooking, venting goes next. But you really want to think about the vent. The other thing we already talked about was the flow of your kitchen. Here's another picture of just a beautifully styled kitchen. We showed this last time, you know, Gagano cooking appliances, all Gagano, tons of modes. Let's say a six burner cooktop, right? Look at where they put the sink. Uses the cooktop. They have to walk a bunch of steps. You know, if they flame up a mat, they could have put a, they could have put a sink right in the middle of that, a good entertaining sink if they wanted something bigger. It made the, uh, the side a wet bar. And number three is kind of the bane of my existence. Uh, most people who've seen webinars will know what that is. That's a down one. Let me be clear, because manufacturers seem to condone this type of uh, picture. This is taken off house, and there's many more of these that crop up than you should. If you cook, a downdraft cannot downdraft properly. And the reason is downdrafts, uh, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you how to vent later, but just briefly. Venting is a function of CFM, which you probably know the motor speed. But the capture, there is no capture area to this, to a downdraft, it's about three inches. So if you create a lot of smoke, like that's a grill in the middle. Think about when you grill outside, what kind of smoke you create. That's the same smoke that you're creating a lot of the grills on the inside. It's just a little different BTU. So you're going to downdraft that smoke not only are you gonna have no capture area, but you're gonna send it 20 feet out with a transition in reverse gravity, it just doesn't work. I only recommend this on existing construction if you have no other contingencies, but in new construction, rethink your design, especially if you could, because it just doesn't work. These are the brands, and a lot of them you know, Subject Wolf you probably know, La Cornu is, uh, we showed you a picture of that. Mila Thermidor, very common, but there's some really neat um, that you haven't heard of. Blue Star makes a great gas range. True makes a really interesting refrigerator. SKS has got the only range that sous vide and has induction in the same range. Uh, Fisher Pagel has got a new 48 with half induction, half gas. And then there's a few that, that we don't carry. Viking has got colors. You know, Monogram's a, a very decent line. Decor's got steam functionality. And no one of these brands can satisfy everybody. So what you want to do is match how you use it with the features of the appliance. Then we talk about options. Okay, you have the basic options that everybody has, range or wall oven in this case, refrigerators, vents, dishwashers. But in this, you know, on larger kitchens, in luxury kitchens, you have other options that we'll get into as well. Steam ovens, speed ovens, microwave drawers, coffee makers, point of use refrigeration. You have options and sinks that you should consider as well. And let's go one by one. Now, I said that there is no one best, but if there is, it would be Drake's $130,000 range. Now, what makes this so good is, first of all, this is gas and electric in the ovens. You have one of each, right? Gas is a moisture heat, so it's better for broiling and roasting. It's got a better broiler to it. Baking. Um, electric is better. It's got a more even heat. It's better for baking. On the top, you can do anything in this range. It's totally customizable. 
So you can do a wok burner, regular burners. You can do grill. You can do a griddle. You can do a French top. The difference between a French top and a grill, although they look the same, is grill is a consistent heat. French top can, you can cook many different items in many different temperatures on the French top. So you have all that options. It's all customizable. What do you do when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're not buying a $50,000 La Cornu? Then you've got to make a choice. And there's so many good brands that instead of buying by brand or buying because the salesman said it was the best in some cases, is really get an idea of how you're going to use the range. You know, I'm always intrigued that some people like to bake and then other people like to cook. There's no intersection between the two, very little. So the first question you ask is, bake roll, how, do you, how do you cook? You know, if you bake more, you want electric. If you boil more, you want more, um, or roast more, you want gas. I'll put a simmer. What kind of function do you want? Grill, griddle, we recommend the infrared. Sous vide, which is precision boiling in a bag. You have some of the options there. French top. What kind of controls do you want? You want smart or you want a basic? La Cronu does not have any controls. You know, now you can do regular oven, you can do steam assist, or you can do a, um, or you can do a steam oven. All do different things. So those are the choices you make. And then you pick, check off each, and then you pick the range based on how you're gonna use it. Wall ones are a little bit easier. I categorize these in three different ways. You have the wall ones that do everything for you, which is meal, wolf, and gen air. Where you, you, add the, you add the food, tell how you want it cooked. The range computes time and temperature. On the wolf, it even calculates rack position. On the meal, you have steam assist functionality. I like the meal of, I, I like meal and wool, but the meal of is easy. You want to bake sourdough bread, which you can do in a steam assist oven. Hit the button that says sourdough bread. Pretty easy. Then you have French doors. French doors are popular commercially because you don't have to lift a heavy turkey over a door. So French doors have become popular. And then you have Gagano, which is in another category. Gagano is for what I would call a real expert cook or a chef because they have modes for everything, 17 different modes. So if you wanna cook pastry, there is a mode for that versus figuring it out in the other ranges. In terms of refrigerator, refrigerators are easy. Refrigerators, as I said before, follow cabinets. Most common cabinet sizes, 30, 36, 42, 48. In a luxury kitchen, this is pro style with a compressor on, on the top to make, it like, uh, to make it look like a restaurant. Then you have a choice between that, a pro style, and something that's integrated. Difference between these two, you see how that door sticks out? It's called a counter dump, right? This is integrated, fits within a 24 inch, uh, 24 inch space. So you won't tell between the cabinet um, and the uh, refrigerator itself. Dimensions here are 18, 24, 30, 36. You can buy this all refrigerator, all freezer, or French door, or any particular combination in a number of different brands. Venting is very important. Typically when I look at venting, we have like, I believe we have a hundred different vents in 30 different stores, probably more. But it really comes down to whether you're gonna put a stainless steel vent in there or you're gonna put a cabinet front or a tile face or something custom. Either way, it doesn't matter as long as you understand the fundamentals of venting. And that is, first of all, a CFM is cubic foot per minute. Right? It's the amount of blower, the amount of air that's extracted per minute. So 600 CFM means 600 cubes of, of air leaving that hood every minute. Now, if you're getting a 48 or 60 inch range, you need 12 to 15 on CFM. That's the equivalent of a small room leaving your house, a small room of air leaving your house every minute, which is why in Massachusetts, we have makeup air laws, anything over 400 CFM, you need a return. Typically a new construction that's done through the HVAC system, um, in Massachusetts, the law. In other parts of the country, it should be law. If it's not, you can run through your HVAC or you can run a return on the other side of the kitchen, but you need to get a fresh air. If you don't have the fresh air, what happens is it's not like you're going to deoxygenate your house. What's going to happen is the air is going to come from places you don't want it to be, like your garage, attic, furnace. So to keep clear in, just remember to make up the air if you don't live in Massachusetts, Massachusetts law. But what what people get wrong in ventilation is the depth of the hood. Depth has to be 24 inches minimum to cover the, to cover the burners because smoke is channeled and then sent out of the house. It's not just immediately extracted like most people think. If you do a lot of wok cooking, 
you do a lot of grilling or maybe grilling, you may want to you may want to go 27 inches. If you're a little bit taller, you just have to worry about the height. The other the other problem I see is duct ruts. People always say, "Is it okay if I?" The answer to that is always no, because people are always asking if you could put different transitions in if they can go 20 feet. And the answer to that is no, because you you reduce the static flow. Short runs are always the best. You want them to either go straight up or straight back without any transitions. Um, as far as duck size, when I started, people actually were doing drier vents. Those are vinyl. They don't match up very well with the grease that come up, and they're only four inches. You need to stand within manufacturer specifications of eight to 10 inches minimum. And remember, in Massachusetts, you do have those makeup laws. Yes, they do check for new construction. We have a vent guide on our website. Download that, read it, hand it to your contractor. It's 50 pages, it's pretty detailed. Dishwashers, dishwashers are either uh, paneled or uh, stainless steel. I asterisked the ones that you're supposed to panel because they fit within 24 inches. They look like a cabinet uh, with a dishwasher stuck on it. But typically a lot of people, the first question they ask is quietness. Quietness is, if, if you don't wanna hear dishwashers, 44 decibels is all you need or less. There's some interesting drying cycles. Uh, Bosch has their uh, crystal dry using volcanic elements. Meal has got the clean dry system pulling outside air in. So hot air meets cold and is dissipated as, uh, as uh, water. You have different interesting cycles now. Meal has got the automatic dispenser. Becco has got the aqua intense cycles. Um, but you have a lot of options. I would probably put the Fisher Pekel with the double drawers in there. Um, and ASCO is a very good dishwasher they've had over the years as well. In terms of steam ovens, steam ovens are great. If you're looking to add an appliance, want to learn what a steam oven does is add moisture rather than baking out nutrients. Um, so you can cook anything in steam. It's great for refreshing, it's great for rice, it's great for vegetables. It'll be the best brownie you ever bake. The best steam ovens are Gaginal with as many modes. Meal is probably the simplest to use. If you're just starting, meal is a good one. I would put wolf in that same category as well. With speed ovens, microwaves, the reason why you hate the taste of microwave is because microwaves target moisture. So speed ovens use uh, convection, 90% convection, 10% microwave power, so you get the speed without that microwavey rubber, lifeless texture to it. Then you have coffee makers. My sister makes her blueberry latte coffee in her Mila coffee maker. Once again, very simple to use. Wolf, I'd put in that category as well. But pretty much every manufacturer will have some kind of coffee system. We review steam, speed, and coffee systems on our blog. We just type it in, best speed ovens, uh, if you want the details of that. In terms of point of use of refrigeration, most people think this, right? You think, you know, beverage center, wine center. But you can buy them stand up. Now, for wine, I would say buy a wine storage system because it preserves wine. You know, Sub Zero has their compressor on rubber grommets um, so it doesn't vibrate because everything kills wine, light, humidity. And I think wine storage systems, if, you, if you're really storing wine for long-term, it's better to do that. If you're doing just, if you're doing just wine basically and, and drink a lot of wine and, and drink and, and move the wine bottles in and out, actually drink the wine, not collect it, a beverage center is just fine. But you typically like in that picture, you don't want to stand up wine over the long-term cork will dry up. And then you obviously have refrigeration. You can buy it stand up, as you, as you can see, you can buy it typically in the 24 inch base size as well. Drawers are fantastic. I love my drawers. We put food in ours, but a lot of people, it's a good way to keep teenagers out by putting their food in a separate drawer so not in the refrigerator. And those are available in 24 and 30 inch matching the cabinet sizes. Ice makers, uh, Ice makers are hot right now because everyone wants a chewable slushy cube, which a lot of them now do have. You can even buy them, gee, as an opal cube that you can buy as a tabletop. But ice makers need to be cleaned. The reason why there's so many problems with ice makers refrigeration is because they get scaled and then they malfunction. If you clean the ice maker, it's worthwhile. If you don't, don't buy one. But you can buy some interesting cubes. It's like seven or eight different cubes. You've got the slushy cubes, which you can chew, which are great for, um, uh, you know, colas and lemonades. And then the big ones are now the craft, 
craft ice cubes have become popular because they're slow dissolving. So you've got a fine cocktail. You're not, you're drinking more of the cocktail, less of the dissolving ice. Sinks run the gamut. You're looking at a galley sink. Uh, I'm sure there's other sinks, Bob, but the galley is, it will have the most accessories. So you could do anything from cutting boards to drying racks to uh, hors d'oeuvre buckets like you're seeing there. Uh, they come in various sizes. Sinks are, are just like uh, you can do pretty much anything with the sink these days. Okay, so now you know the brands. Now you know the, uh, the products. How do you make it different? This is a kind of an expensive, um, an expensive uh, kitchen, even though it looks you know, like basic appliances. Now, for those people that are trying to dip their toe in and, and change their white kitchen, this may not be the best way to do it in all orange here. So if you're just trying to introduce color, best thing you can do is maybe a pop of color. That's a nice kitchen. See the pop, it's got, it's got the orange uh, door matching the orange. This may be a little extreme for a lot of people. I, I've looked at a lot of colored kitchens. Problem is over, over time, this can be uh, a little bit of passe. It, it can become dated, but this is interesting. So just think about it. If you don't, you don't have to do color throughout, just put it on your refrigerator or on your, on your stove for a, a little design detail. In terms of color, La Cronu, not just their colors, but their trims are just elegant. The one that's really uh, interesting too is Blue Star. Uh, I'm sorry, La Cronu is so good. They make even mint. I'm, I'm not really partial to green. Um, green's been discontinued by every manufacturer, but they make mint look good. But the manufacturer that has the most colors is actually Blue Star. And it looks like this kitchen is trying to implement as many as they can. Blue Star's got a thousand with uh, 10 different trims. This is a, a really different kitchen. You've got turquoise, white, and some kind of green on top of it. I look at the, uh, the island. It looks like somebody just sawed it off on. And I said, wow, it looks pretty good. And then, you know, you look at this picture. Now, if you see the book, that's a trip right underneath it. It kind of explains a little bit. But this may not be something you emulate, but... Just know that you can, you can do any color and you can customize color. And a lot of manufacturers have it, not just these two. You know, Cafe's got their whites, been really popular. Obviously, True's got a bunch. Um, Viking's got 17. Um, the Bertazzoni and the lesser expensive Italians all have a number of different hoods. So you can introduce hoods, I mean, I'm sorry, colors. You can introduce colors in a lot of different manufacturers. If you don't want to do color, how about a panel? You could penalize everything but cooking. And there's nothing, it, it looks really good. The better the cabinet, the more you want to panel it. This is a, a display in Dorchester on the left-hand side. These are all paneled. You know, you have your refrigerator drawers, you have your dishwasher drawers, and everything's paneled. This is an interesting concept, but what they did is a pro refrigerator and a counter refrigerator has more space than integrated because the integrated is 24 and the um, counter depth is 27. So you pick up a little bit more cubic footage. What these people did that was kind of cool is they, they brought the cabinets forward. So they got the look of it integrated with the better cubic footage of, of a pro. The only thing they did wrong is that, you know, in a luxury kitchen, you may want to consider doing this flush mounting. It's just a detail, but you may want to have your contractor look at it. If you could flush mount your, a lot of your, uh, cooktops, and certainly your wall opens as well. It's a, just a neater look. Okay, you don't want to color, you don't want a panel, you can expose. This is a more expensive option because really the only ones that do it are Sub-Zero and True, other than the, uh, the, under -counter, the under counter refrigeration units. But these, you can look inside. It's kind of a different look. Um, again, more expensive because only the more expensive manufacturers have it, although LG does have their InstaView but it's, it's more of affordable luxury type. Bonus points if you have color and you expose. Triple points if you do a accent, which uh, you have the burnished brass with the color, which is white, plus, um, plus exposing your appliances like they did here. But this is a nice, if you default to white as so many people do, just know that the hardware is another design element. So in New England, brass is always in. Um, may not be polished brass, but burnished brass and antique brass. I've been here for 37 years. That's never gone out. Nice, be a nice detail rather than going with a, 
a chrome or, or some kind of satin pull. Maybe, maybe you do some kind of brass. Okay, service. Service is a problem. This is a, our typical day here. We have 91 deliveries, 194 service stops. Technical appliances need highly technical service people. And I'm speaking to a lot of people, um, especially in California and New York, I can tell by the, uh, uh, the email addresses. You need to find those people. And really that's who you give the edge to. I, I've, I've said that the brands, you should buy the brand that best fits your particular cooking style and no one brand dominates everything, but you wanna overlay repair. So if one brand's got much better repair than the other, you almost wanna give them the benefit of the doubt. And the other thing is installation. You, you know, I've said, you know, panelize this, like it's easy, like you just, you take a hammer and you put a nail in and you just bang the nail in and you hang it like a picture frame. It's actually really complicated. So one thing is you wanna set up with your GC, who's doing the installation? Is your client store with an installation department or are they gonna handle it too? It's two things that you really have to worry about after the fact. And lastly, the topic of conversation for everybody is availability is, you know, the supply chains are all broken for everything. Um, and it's not just appliances. And, the, and there's, a, there's a, a way around this is, before 2020, the way everybody used to do this um, is they play in the kitchen, order the cabinets, and somewhere a month or two before they ordered their appliances, and that was fine when there was plenty of supply. But nowadays, what you should be doing is, in the planning phase, you should be ordering appliances. Now, you should know, sink, uh, wall of cooktop. And if you know the brands, buy it then. Because it's gonna take a while for that project to be consummated. It's certainly gonna be well over eight months. If it's well over eight months, you won't have a problem with availability. It's just when you start under six months. And I know that sounds shocking that you limit your choices. Um, the more you go down to a two month, you have far few choices. So if you wanna have all the choices, Plan your head and then it's not a problem. And in luxury kitchens, it does take that time. So I don't see availability if everything goes to plan or if you, if you, if you buy it when you plan it, you shouldn't have a problem. So let's have some key takeaways that you can remember. First of all, hire good people. And yes, you can wait. You know, take those 18 questions. If you need more, we have more. If, if you live in the Massachusetts area, name a, a few good contractors, we know those too. Understand your lifestyle and how you use your appliances. Don't buy the brand before you buy, before they answer the question, does it fit to my lifestyle? No one brand dominates. Start at your sink, move to your cooking, everything else will take care of themselves. And then figure out what secondary appliances you want and then you use. Who fix appliances? is a problem and you don't wanna get stuck with it before your Thanksgiving dinner. So figure out who the experts and what brands are good in your area. And then just buy your appliances before you think you need them and you won't have a problem with availability. And with that, I'll bring you back to Pat. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Let's get, dive right into the Q and A. Um, if, if uh, anyone out there has any questions for us, uh, use that Q&A feature in the Zoom window uh, to send them over to us. We'll dive into some of the questions that were sent over during registration. Um, so Steve, first up, um, do the designer brands ever offer suite or package deals? Yes. Um, most of them do from time to time. The Thermidor 123, what was introduced in 2007, still is, is still there. Meaning, if you buy a stove, if you buy a Thermidor Pro Range, or while the cooked up, get a free dishwasher. If you add other things, you get a free hood. Now, they're out of stock on hoods, so I'd be careful there. Janier matched that Thermidor 123 with a $13.99 rebate. Sub Zero has, from time to time, $1,000 with, with Wolf Cove and, uh, and, uh, Sub-Zero appliances, typically those three are the ones uh, that have the most, but from time to time, Mila will have 10% off if you buy certain, um, if you buy a certain number of appliances as well. Great, so and, uh, you talked about flush mounting a wall oven during the presentation. Um, the question was about 
does uh does Geigano specifically does the Geigano 400 series wall open allow for flush mount and maybe what what other brands might be an option there as well well no they don't um part of what makes Gagano so interesting is they're the ones, if you look at a bank of wallets and, and, you know, I mentioned certainly Mueller and uh, Wolf are the most unique. The ones that, the one that looks the most different is Gagano because it was designed by Bang & Olsen. Those are the Danish kind of electronics people. And so one thing they don't do is they don't flush mount it because the style is what they do. They, they, there's no flush mounting ability to do that. Obviously, when you think Gagano, somehow you think Mila and Mila, I know you can flush mount it. You can flush mount Wolf. Most you can. Um, I know because I flush mounted my, my Wolf oven. My sister flush mounted her, uh, her uh, Mila coffee system, her Mila systems as well. So you can do it on a lot of ones. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, I don't want to go out there and say everybody can do it. But if, if anyone has any questions, you can certainly uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll ask our installation people, but I think most can. And uh, continue to send in the, the questions into our Q&A. We, we'll have, uh, we have a question about um, converting a range to LP. So if there's a range that someone's interested, can you get, um, so I guess it's specific to us here. If you have a range that I want in uh, the outlet center, can you get and install an LP conversion kit? Will it work the same or will it be inferior? Will it work any differently? Well, there's two different ways. I'm not sure if uh, outlet moves so fast. I'm not sure what range um, is LP, but here's, here's how LP actually works. Um, there's two different ways installations where one, it becomes, it's, it's, uh, it's designed for LP. And in a lot of, uh, some ranges are like that. The other one ranges, you get an LP kit, you convert the orifice uh, from natural gas to LP. Typically, most reduce static flow marginally. Like I want to say if there's a 15,000 BTU, it goes down to 14. Um, on, on most, some don't. I don't know if, if you want a specific answer to a specific type of range, I'm happy to do that, but some do and some don't. Yeah, Katie, we can follow up with you after that about the, uh, the specific range you're looking for. Um, next up, can you mix manufacturers of a range and a range hood? Yes, definitely. Really, the only thing I'm in really interested in, in ventilation is, is, is what people get wrong, is the duct run and the capture. I mean, people figure out that you need a high CFM hood. Typically, most come that way. But if you don't have the capture and the duct run is wrong, then so will the, uh, you won't be able to do that properly. You could absolutely mix. As long as, those variables are satisfied. You can buy any book, period. Or we're getting those basics right that you outlined, right? Yeah, no, I can't speak for some off brands, but most of the major brands have good blowers. You know, I, I don't go to that level of, most of what we sell is, is, is major branded. Um, I, I, I don't know how the, uh, you know, if, if someone buys an off brand, how that particular motor works, because we don't sell that type of stuff here. Okay, next up, uh, Steve, what uh, the question is, what do you think about induction ranges? Uh, what, you know, what are the, what might be the benefits and considerations there? Induction has become, is gonna become a lot more popular. New York banned gas ranges in 2027 um, because I guess gas has been, if you don't vent gas properly, it's actually worse than smoking in your house. We did a, we did a, a webinar and I, it was shocking. It, it, you know, kids develop asthma and all the rest of it, but the key is venting. But in terms of, in terms of induction, I, I, anything you can do in gas can be done better in induction. It's faster, to, it's faster to heat. It's, it's got an infinite simmer. The best simmers, you know, the Thermidor is hundred BTUs, but it's an on off. You can theoretically do one, you can do a, uh, you can do anything in a in, in a um, in a um, in an induction. Not only that, it's easy to vent, it's easy to clean. The stuff doesn't bake on because the way induction works, the magnet hits the metal of the pan. The metal pan does the cooking. The only heat you get on the on the on the uh, cooktop is a re residual heat from the pot to the glass, not vice versa. 
So anything you can do in induction is going to be better than in gas. I think over time, people are going to have to uh, consider it because I, I do think rightfully or wrongfully that I think gas is going to be phased out certainly by 2035, 2040, I would think. All right, next up. Also more child safety. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. Um, next up. So if you're if you're using a speed oven, first as a convection oven, how long might it take to cool down safely enough to just use it as the microwave? Well, the great thing about small appliances and why things like air fryers work in small appliances and do not work in large appliances, it, it's it's so much easier to heat up. I wish Saab was here because that would be a, a great question for her, but I don't have a speed oven. I've never used one. But you got to believe that it's a lot of people that that cook and use speed and steam. Those become their primary ovens, with their larger oven only being used for holidays. So I want to say that it's 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 much um, it's much faster to uh, to heat up and cool down. But I don't have a direct answer. I will get that for you later. We can follow up there. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely follow up. Um, you touched on steam ovens during the presentation. Um, some, so for someone who's interested in steam cooking, what might be the considerations there to consider? For steam ovens, I, I think if someone is, is doing it, uh, there's, there's two different classifications uh, for steam for me. And, and we write this in our, in our blog and, and, and Saba cooks almost exclusively in, in um, in speed and steam when she's here, is that first of all, everything tastes better coming out of the steam oven. It just does. It's, it's the way it's almost the food is intended to cook. You're adding moisture. When you think about cooking, you think about boiling, as much as we all like to grill and everything, you're really reducing moisture and reducing flavor. Uh, steam adds that. Now, if you wanna use a steam oven flat out, the one that I would really recommend I think Wolf makes a good product. But the easiest one to use, we just walks you through it, is, is Mila. They have that touch in that M touch interface makes everything so much easier. We're just hitting buttons. So there's no figuring out because here's what happens. If you got to figure out, what's going to happen is you're going to figure it out a week from now and then a month from now, and then it's, you're not going to use it. But I think if you're really interested in, in, uh, in seeing, we've got some great videos. Saab is it. It's just a wizard on that. She's got some great videos on Steam that you should look at, not just how to use it, but recipes that you can do. And, and you can do that on the meal. It prompts you for everything. That's where I would start if you were just starting. First of all, go on YouTube, watch Saba, and then really, if you're really interested, consider the meal product. Like Drake. <laughs> Next up, Steve, we have a question. I'm looking to add three appliances, dishwasher, washer, dryer, in 200 square feet. Suggestions for organizing that? Mm -hmm. Small appliances, like we, 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 we do things on, we, I think we've done things on small appliances uh, before, or it's been a question asked in the webinar. But you can reduce three things in your kitchen. You can reduce the refrigerator, you can reduce the stove, and you can, re and you can re uh, reduce the dishwasher. The one that matters least, that you don't lose much on, is actually the dishwasher. You open up an 18 or 24 inch dishwasher, you're not losing much in an 18. That's the first place I'm going. It's getting 18 inch dishwasher. Any small apartment is, you know, when you go from 30 to 24 in a range, you lose a lot of things. You lose brand choice, you lose selection. Same thing with refrigerators. The smaller you go with those, and you know, obviously the more expensive it becomes for the same features. So rather than doing that, that should be the last resort. Dishwasher, you don't lose anything. And the other thing is, if you're gonna put laundry in there, simple. I mean, I'm not a big believer in countertop stuff. I just don't think it works like the built-ins. You get a 24 inch, you get the 24 inch compact laundry, not the combination because those don't work, but the, the uh, washer and then the condensation dryer so you don't have to bend outward. That's what I would do in a 200 square foot place is 
is, is get the set and get an 18 inch dishwasher, 24 inch wash and dryer, 18 inch dishwasher. And then related to that is uh, another question. Uh, what are the best small scale built-in panel ready appliances? What is well, obviously we'll go back to the small scale 18 inch dishwasher, obviously, um, but most everything follows cabinets, right? So you can get, you can get an 18 inch refrigerator panel, but it's expensive. Um, and, and when you go integrated, and we, we did a, I did, we did two tongue in cheek videos on why you should never buy integrated and why you should buy counter depth. People got really mad about it, but, um, and I do think you should get integrated. And I do think that you should get counter depth, but you do lose that capacity, which is a concern if it, that's going to be only thing. You can panelize a 24 inch. We have, we have all these articles on our, on our blog, you know, best 24 inch refrigerators. You can do those paneled. You can do 18s, you can do 30s. Problem is, is the smaller you go, the more expensive. Um, you can't panel cooking. So 18 inch, 24 inch, really that's, that's what you're looking at. So next up here, um, there's a question about the mo uh, someone wants to know the most reliable brands. Um, do you want to? I know we have a couple of resources on that, but you want to take that yeah. one? Yeah, actually, we, we just published our video on the most reliable brands. And it's really, um, you have to be careful. And I, and, I, and I make a big point of saying, it's easy for me to point out, you know, we did 47,391 service calls last year. 47,000, we've done 120, 000, over 120,000 service calls in the Boston area in under three years. And here's what you can glean from the numbers is really, I'll give you the most reliable brands. I'm sure LG's number one, G's up there. Uh, I wanna say Thermador Wolf are up there and Meadle is up there. Uh, but really what you wanna look is, look at the brands, it's fine. But look at the categories because washers are outstanding. I mean, an LG washer only fails 3.28% of the time in the first year. Whereas appliances in general will fail 9.5 or need a service call, that's not necessarily for you. We'll, we'll need a service call 9.5% of the time. So the most reliable brands are gonna do dishwashers, they're gonna do ranges, they're not gonna do as many refrigerators. So the most reliable products are gonna be laundry, definitely washers, dryers, hoods, um, are another incredibly reliable thing. So look at, look at the brands and then look at the categories um, because there's a huge disparity in refrigeration between the most reliable and then the not most reliable. Washer dryers, all good. Dishwashers, mostly good. Ranges, you know, because you're talking about legacy technology. Gas range hasn't changed as much other than them adding BTUs. So electric ranges, another thing they put a, it's almost impossible to kill electric range because they put a glass top over the things that work. So the ones that sell the most electric and gas ranges and laundry are the ones that are going to win. And unfortunately, when we talk about luxury, you're talking about a 60 inch range. That's the equivalent of two ranges plus steam. Plus it, it's just like five appliances in one. So is it really fair? No, but it does give you a good indication between similar brands of how reliable they are, but definitely look at the categories as well. And as, as, as Steve mentioned, that um, article is updated on our blog with, uh, the new article with video on there from a little more depth as well. Um, just a, one more reminder to send in any, any questions to us in the Q and A. We have a couple more questions to get through before we wrap up here. Um, Steve, next up, can the, can the Gigano downdraft vent be made to work adequately with an induction cook service? You, you touched on, on, on downdrafts earlier, but with induction. I'm an anti-downdraft guy. I'm sorry, you just can't reverse gravity. And the, and the question is, is um, can an induction work better than gas? Yes, because there's, light, there's less heat emission off. When you're talking about a gas cooktop, right? Gas is a diffused heat. So when we talk about 18,000 BTUs, you're not talking about 18,000, you're talking, you're talking about, I think it's 12 to 14,000, the rest is diffused as heat. 
You don't have that in a uh, in an induction, so it will work better. But if you're gonna if you're gonna put an induction burner on full power and really walk cook on it, which you can do, there's no downdraft system that can do that. But it'll be better if you're saying this is my only choice. This is all I got. And get an induction cooktop instead of a gas cooktop with a downdraft. But it's still, you know, the more you cook, the less effective it becomes. And then there, we have we had a question kind of related to that. How would you compare induction versus a pro gas? What is what are the differences there specifically? Okay, um, you know it's funny. We used to have a glass kitchen here. It was the most expensive thing we ever did. I don't know if you remember that, Pat. We had a uh, we glassed a kitchen. It was made out of all glass, so you can see the connections of how things were connected. And then we compared <clears throat> all the all the gas, all the all the cooking times. At that time, it was electric, gas, um, induction, and then we put a commercial wok in there. It was twenty five thousand BTUs at the time. This is twenty years ago. And there's no question the induction would beat the 25,000 BTU commercial gas every day of the week, right? And you, you have all these accelerated benefits um, of safety, uh, less heat emission, faster boiling, faster serving, except for two things. Um, when induction goes, who fixes an induction driver? Not that every burner will go. That's the first problem. The second thing is, if you want really powerful burners, a lot of these share power between burners, whereas gas, it doesn't. So a gas is going to be better if you cook more things. Induction is going to be better if you cook two things, right? Because of the power share between the burners. But other than that, though, induction is a, is a better one-to-one -one burner than, um, than gas is, unless you're cooking more. And the repair side, it's, it's induction is not as bad because it's still covered by gas. But replacing induction drivers can be a problem with an unqualified technician. So that's how I would do it. If you're looking for burner performance, check any box, induction is going to be faster, except for the repair, except if you're cooking multiple items. Two more questions to get through here. Um, Steve, what do you think of smart functionality? And should we consider smart appliances? You, you touched on that in the presentation as well. Yeah, that was the last presentation on smart functionality. And it, and it's one of my favorite webinars because I, I really didn't know much about smart until I researched it. And there's endless potential to smart. It's not been realized that. Yes, you can tell Alexa to start your oven. Yes, you can turn on remotely. Yes, you can check your filters. Yes, it'll text you when you're, when you're um, and I like it for the laundry the best because who hasn't sat in front of the washer with like three minutes left? Um, it'll text you when it's done. Great. The best one is actually Weber because Weber tells you to turn the food, tells you when to take it off. But for that next level, hey, Alexa, I want you to cook my lasagna. It, it's not like that. It's just basic oh, problems. Couldn't find anything to do that. Basic, uh, you know, text functionality. I do think that the next few years, I think the next level, uh, they're going to achieve it. It probably should have been done, but. I think a lot of manufacturers scrambling to supply existing product and spending less time on futuristic smart stuff. But smart's interesting now. I wouldn't buy a product based on it, but, but you do have some, some reminder and some automatic technology that's, that's kind of fun. I, I think what GE did was brilliant over Thanksgiving. They, they um, as a publicity stunt, added a turkey button to every one of their smart ranges remotely. So a lot of the manufacturers can add modes, but that doesn't change the actual oven. It just gives you another mode that you, that you can download. And then they actually, um, they actually put a gobble gobble to it too, which was kind of funny. But I, I like it. I think there's potential, but I don't think it's something you need to buy now. Yep. And if you're interested more in smart appliances, we did just do a webinar on the, on the topic, went into a lot of depth there, as Steve mentioned. Uh, one more question. Um, should you buy all your appliances from one brand or should you, should you consider a mix? That's a great question. And it really depends on what we're talking about. I, I would say in the affordable luxury category, it's better to go with all of one. 
all one brand because the styles change and really the products don't change that much. When we're talking about the luxury space, I mean, if we use Drake as an example, I mean, he mixed the brands. I, and, and I think the more you panelize something, the more irrelevant it is. really what's important to you. And that's the brand. I don't think it matters the handle style. If we look at, go back to his kitchen, of, of a retro range with modern hood and technical meal of products on one side paneled on the other work great. Um, and again, on the luxury side, you have the ability to get whatever you want. You just have to pick it, understand it, buy it and not worry about what brand it is. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Oh, one more question just came in. Um, is it okay to keep the microwave over the cooktop in a remodel? since that's the original setup. Well, you know, again, microwaves are, you know, it's probably one of the most intelligent things in the appliance industry of actually putting microwave because that's kind of where it belongs, except for one thing. If we're gonna go back and talk about how to vent properly, right? You have to understand that if 21 inches didn't work in that number four viewed kitchen that you saw, then 16 in a microwave won't either. Right. Microwaves haven't changed since the original design in 1990. They're only 16 inches deep. They're very shallow. There's no capture area and they're only 300 CFM. So the question is, can you do it during your model? Absolutely. Is this something I put over my, um, is this something I put over my range top? Absolutely not. You know, that smoke's going to just billow past those front burners into your space. It's not something that belongs in, 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 a, in a kitchen that's got high output burners, really quite awesome. You can do it in a remodel. I mean, you could do it as your, the question is, can I use it while I'm remodeling? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with it, other than it won't work in high output cooking. All right, thanks, Steve. Thank um, you, Pat. Yep, yeah, so we'll just wrap up here. Don't remember, um, all of our previous webinars are available on our YouTube channel and in, in our learning center on our website. Um, we will, be sending this recording uh, via email. Uh, so we'll be on the lookout for that. And if there's any questions that come up, feel free to feel free to reply. Um, and thank you for thank you for joining. Have a nice weekend.